Thank you for joining us on this cold evening. Um, my name is Beth Jacquet. Uh, I lead the Schwartz Visiting Program uh, very proudly. Happy to represent Pomfret School and the Schwartz Brothers this evening. Without a doubt, we are in the depths of winter, a perfect time to light your inner fire and get your minds and hearts and thoughts moving to fight this chill. Since 1989, world-renowned experts in their fields have vis visited Pomfret School under the auspices of the Schwartz Visiting Fellow Program at this very cold and dark time of year. This extraordinary speaker series is the result of the vision and generosity of Michael, class of 66, and Eric, class of 69. Our speaker today stands in great company with former fellows, animal scientist and advocate Temple Grandin, author and alumnus Bill Bryson, journalist and author Jessica Bruder, I know that many of you were here last year with Ms. Bruder, historian David McAuliffe, and celebrity chef Ming Tsai. These eminent visiting fellows have enriched both the school of, and the Pomfret community each cold January. We extend our profound gratitude to both Michael and Eric Schwartz. Thank you. Um, and I would turn it over now to Tim Richards, our head of school. Thank you. We're going to let that roll in the background. We're going to let that roll. Great. Great. Good evening, everyone. Nice to have you all here. Um, we have been incredibly fortunate over the past couple of days to have Ndaba Mandela with us. Um, sharing stories and engaging with kids, both in this large setting, uh, but attending classes and a nice uh, dinner last night, spending time with children, our, our students at meals, and really getting to know our community. Um, and so it's with tremendous joy and, and pleasure that I welcome you all here tonight to share a little bit of the experience that we've been uh, blessed to have over the last uh, 36 hours or so. Uh, it has really been a, a wonderful time. Ndaba Mandela, the grandson of the iconic Nelson Mandela, is a torchbearer for his grandfather's enduring legacy. As the co-founder and chairman of the Africa Rising Foundation, Ndaba is dedicated to promoting a positive image of Africa globally <clears throat> and fostering growth in education, employment, and international corporate alliances. He is also uh, the co-founder and co-chairman of the Mandela Institute for Humanity, uplifting the next generation of African leaders and advocating for the end of HIV AIDS. Named one of the 28 Men of Change by BET, Ndaba's influence extends to various platforms. His role in the international Emmy-nominated docuseries The Mandela Project highlights the profound impact of Nelson Mandela's life. Ndaba's recent book, which I had the pleasure of reading, Going to the Mountain, Life Lessons from My Grandfather, Nelson Mandela, provides a unique perspective on Nelson Mandela's life through the eyes of his grandson. Through initiatives and work like Nelson Mandela, Ndaba continues to give back to the community embodying the values instilled by his legendary grandfather. And it's with tremendous pleasure and honor that I encourage you to welcome, give offer a warm welcome to our guest tonight, Mr. Ndaba Mandela. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. How do you do this cold night? We're not used to these temperatures where I'm from. <laughs> so we all know Nelson Mandela. My grandfather's a revolutionary. But I am not a revolutionary. But I would like to share my st story with you today. I was born in 1982 during the time when the apartheid government was at the helm of our society. A system so brutal that if a child was born from a mixed race couple, they would remove that child from both parents and place that child in an area of just mixed race people. South Africa today still battles with the legacy of apartheid. Our society having been divided into four main racial groups, white at the top, followed by the Indian, followed by colored people, 
followed by black people right at the bottom. So there is a divide even today between colored people and black people. Here in America, we're all colored and black is one thing, right? But in South Africa, that still exists. Now, the end of apartheid truly did not come because of our fight against apartheid. We had many people from all over the world who were assisting us gain our freedom and our independence from this tyranny of apartheid. Many people across the continent of Africa assisted us, smuggling us out of the country, training us with military, training our people. Some of our people were sent to Russia, others went to uh, Cuba, others went to China, who were taught to be teachers, who were taught to be doctors. But the real tide started to change against apartheid was because of the power of the purse. Young people here in America were putting their bodies on the line protesting for the freedom of Nelson Mandela, putting their bodies on the line at the embassy of South Africa in Washington, D.C., calling for their colleges, universities to divest from South Africa. Coca-Cola had a bottling plant in apartheid South Africa. Kodak had a plant in apartheid South Africa. And because of these young people, many of them who believed in freedom, equality, and justice, many of them who look like you, not even like me, white young people, white kids who actually believed in freedom were putting their bodies in line and calling their colleges to the colors. And that is when the tide of our party started to change. And eventually, Nelson Mandela came out in 1990, on the 11th of February. And the whole world was in jubilation. The whole world celebrated because freedom had reigned. Freedom had won. Finally, after 100 years of battling racist government of South Africa, you must understand that the Union of South Africa was established in 1910, 1910 and the African National Congress, of which Nelson Mandela later led, was established in 1912, literally two years after the establishment of the Union of South Africa, which was in direct response to the establishment of South Africa because that is when the first racist rules, when they tried to take away, not tried, they actually took away land and marginalized people from their own land. Now, when I was eight years old is when I met my grandfather for the first time. And my parents, we never talked about my grandfather. I never even knew I had a grandfather. Literally two days before we went to visit him in jail, I knew I found out I had a girlfriend, a grandfather who was in jail, right? And so when I got to this place, I was picturing concrete bars, wardens, guards, dogs, heavy security. But when we got there, it was a house, a normal house, a house better than the one I lived in. There was a swimming pool. I never had a swimming pool. I met a chef for the very first time. We had delicious food. And of course, we met the man himself. Now, I didn't know that the last six years of Nelson Mandela's incarceration, they had removed him from Robben Island and put him in this house called Victor Vester because they were trying to defeat Nelson Mandela mentally. They were trying to break him down mentally, you see? to say, Mandela, denounce your movement, denounce your comrades, and we will make sure that you have this house to enjoy with you and your family for the rest of your days. And after 21 years of incarceration, they tried to break him down, and Mandela never conceded. He kept strong because he knew what he fought for all those years. He knew what he sat in jail for all those years. His resolve was solid. And so there I was looking at this and saying, wow, what a beautiful house. And that was the first time I had an idea of what I wanted to do when I grew up. I said, when I grow up, I'm not going to be a police officer. I'm not going to be a lawyer. No, when I grow up, I want to go to jail. <laughs> this is the place to be. I'm going to have my own chef. Damn, I need to go to jail. Anyway, we went back to our normal lives, and again, no talk of granddad, 
But the whole world, you can see in the news, they're proud of him, but no talk of grandeur. Anyway, one day, I'm outside a house in Soweto, playing marbles with my friend, and this black BMW rolls up, and up jumps a man wearing a suit and tie, and he comes directly to me, and he says, are you Ndaba? And I say, yes, and I'm quite puzzled. And he says, well, I've been sent by your grandfather to come and fetch you, let's go. And I say, no, 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 no. I'm not going anywhere. He says to me, are you stupid? Do you have any idea who your grandfather is? Do you want me to get fired? In the back of my mind, I'm thinking stranger danger. <laughs> and eventually the man gives up and he leaves. And when my father came home later that evening, I told him what had transpired and he said to me, Ndaba, if that man comes again, you should go with him. Lo and behold, the man came back later that week <clears throat> and I jumped in with him and off we drove to the leafy white suburbs of northern Johannesburg. And as we approached the house, it was an electric, electronic gate, it opened, we went inside, and I could see men with earpieces and guns wearing suits. On this side, there were uniformed cops. We go inside the house, and there was a lot of commotion. People were cleaning, people were busy, you know? And I met Mama Oli for the first time, Mama Oli, the size of a house. She was my grandfather's cook. You must know, you must never trust a skinny chef, huh? <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, I'm not dissing her, I'm actually giving her respects. And um, she made me this sandwich, it was so delicious. I wondered, oh my God, what has she put in the sandwich? But later, I had realized that she had put a secret ingredient inside. Do you know what that secret ingredient is? Love. She made it with love, ladies and gentlemen. And as I finished my sandwich, my grandfather came in <clears throat> and he said, Ndaba, I am sending your father to university. Your father never had the opportunity to go to university. So I don't want him to worry about you. I want him to focus on his studies. So when your father goes to university, you will stay with me. And that is how I moved in with my grandfather at the age of about 11 years old. So my father went to university for the first time at the age of 45. He graduated when he was about 50, and he died when he was 55 years old. My mother had died two years before that. They had both contracted HIV AIDS. And so, it was a moment where the family got together and said, what are we gonna tell the world of how my father had died? One of my cousins raised their hand and said, well, HIV AIDS doesn't kill you, it only kills your immune system, so you're unable to defend yourself against common viruses and diseases like TB, pneumonia. My grandfather said, no, we shall not do that. We shall simply say the life of my son was taken by HIV AIDS. And so we went outside the house, and the paparazzi was there, there was a table that was set up. My grandfather sat down, we all stood behind him, and he read the statement. And it was for the first time that a prominent family had disclosed the actual cause of death of one of their loved ones. And it was a very poignant moment in our history because we gave courage for other families to be able to deal with this disease head on, to put it out on the table because people were dying in silence. People were dying in isolation because they had felt as though they had been engaged in some dirty behavior or they had been doing something that was out of the ordinary. And no, they had been doing what normal people do. Making love and showing love is what people normally do. How can you die from showing love? This is an unnatural disease. And so when United Nations AIDS came to ask me to be one of their um, ambassadors, it was an obvious yes. And I worked with them and we traveled to Brazil for the World Cup. We actually had started in South Africa and Brazil, in South Africa World Cup in 2010. 2014 was Brazil, 2018 was Mother Russia, as they call it. <clears throat> and we went around talking to orphanages, talking to sex workers about the importance of knowing one's status and always making sure you use protection when you're engaging in sexual activities. Now, our people really started to break that cycle down because really the, the, the real problem that we're fighting was not the disease itself, it was really the stigma around HIV AIDS. The stigma was killing people more than the disease itself, especially those who were engaging in same-sex relationships. You go to the doctor, you get tested, they say, no, please bring your partner. 
Now, your partner is the same sex. Your partner comes in. The very same doctors who are supposed to be giving you the care and attention, those are the same people now ridiculing you because you're in the same sex relationship. And of course, this was a moment for us to be able to talk about gay rights. So I joined the LGBTQI movement. And we talked about people's rights, having access to quality education, having access to resources so they can be able to protect themselves. And we got into a campaign where we said, we want zero to be the goal, right? And we use soccer as an analogy to say, we want zero new deaths related to HIV AIDS. Do not allow HIV to score a goal. Do not allow us to have any more new infections related to HIV AIDS. So we want zero to be our goal. And it was quite a powerful campaign that we had started in, in Brazil. And after, after Russia, we actually traveled to Netherlands. Before Netherlands, two years before that, I was in Durban and KZN in South Africa, where I met Prince Harry. And Prince Harry and I then started a relationship and became friends. And so by the time 2018 came, I had released a book. Now this book called Going to the Mountain, Life Lessons from My Grandfather, is a book in which I share 11 life lessons from my grandfather, leadership lessons. One of the lessons is the tallest tree catches the hardest wind. The tallest tree catches the hardest wind, ladies and gentlemen. As a tall tree, you have a responsibility, you have an obligation to look after the other trees. You have the obligation and responsibility to make sure that everybody in your family, doing what trees do, you have to spread the seed, you have to provide shade, right? You have to make sure that everybody has access to sunlight, right? So that they can grow, right? And that's just one of the many lessons. I don't want to tell you the other lessons because I want you to get the book, right? <laughs> and so going to the mountain is really referring to two things. The first thing, in our culture, when we reach the age of about 16, 18, 20, we have to go and get circumcised. It's a rite of passage, you see. We do not get circumcised when we're young. We get circumcised when you're older because it's a, it's a rite of passage from boyhood to manhood, right? And you can imagine the first thing that happens, <laughs> right? That's the first thing that happens. After that, you know, you are healing and they're teaching you about your history, your culture, your heritage. What is it to mean, what is it to be a man? The first step in being a man is, of course, removing the foreskin. Once you've healed and you come out, you reintegrate into society because everything is happening in a secluded place, right? Once you reintegrate into society, they give you a new name. So my name that I was given is Zuliachika. Zuliachika means the world is changing. And often the names that were given, we have to live up to those names. We have to follow those names because that is a calling. It is a character that they have seen in you and so they say this is the name that he deserves because we have seen this character in this young man, right? The second job you have to do, you have to, you have to get married, you have to get a partner, right? And you have to have a home, you have to have kids, right? For, fortunately or unfortunately for me, I was with a young lady, but unfortunately we didn't get married, but fortunately I have kids. Beautiful kids, right? Um, so I'm still looking for that second step. Even though I skipped the second step, I went straight to the third one. But I'm proud to say both kids come from the same woman. Thank you very much. Let me dust my shoulders off. Um, the second meaning of going to the mountain basically refers to the struggles that young black people have to go through in this world. You are living in the ghetto. You have to study. There are social ills that are happening in the ghetto. There's gang violence, there's drugs, there's domestic abuse, 
You need to make sure that you find time to study because you need to get the best grades. You want to go into an Ivy League school, right? From there, you get into the Ivy League school. How are you going to pay for that education? You finish your education. You go into the workplace where you have to compete against your white privileged counterparts, right? So every stage of your life, you're going to the mountain. My grandfather says, after climbing a great hill and you reach the top, you realize there are many more mountains that you have to climb. So this is going to the mountain, ladies and gentlemen. We have to go to the mountain. We have to challenge ourselves and we have to meet the challenges of the day. But the one thing that my grandfather believed in more than anything is the young people. The young people. You must imagine, Madiba went to jail for what? 27 years. He came out, he couldn't relate to this world, right? I remember once, the cameras, they used to have that, remember that microphone that had like the fluff on it and they would usually put it on top. They came with the camera, they were doing it. To, my grandfather said, what animal is that? <laughs> and he said, no, no, it's a microphone. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so he came out to a world that he didn't relate to. And he actually didn't want to be president, but he was forced to be president. Because all these years, people had been screaming for him, right? He believed in young people so much that he actually wanted to reduce the voting age to 14. That's how much he believed in young people. He believed young people were the ones who were going to be able to carry our world to the next frontier, to the next plateau. You know, we as elderly people, we are too stuck on, oh, the Cold War. Oh, apartheid. Oh, colonialism. Oh, I hate those people. Oh, the Europeans. No, the young people don't care about that. The young people want to know, are you, do you have the merit? Do you have the ability to do your job? Are you competent if I put you in that position? That's what the young people want to know. They don't want to know where you come from. Yes, OK, but that's not really the point. Now, we have a crisis in South Africa. They call it load shedding, right? Where we have power surges, right? So for example, this area will have no power for two hours. Then when the power comes back, the area next door won't have power for two hours. And then they switch around the area, so they call it load shedding. And this was caused because our former president, Zuma, put people in charge of the most complex company, like the power utility. Putting your friends in charge, nepotism they call it, right? You're putting your friends in charge of the most complicated company, that person doesn't even know where it begins or ends. And six years later, we have these huge problems of power surges because there was mismanagement, there was embezzlement, guys are siphoning off funds to put into their pockets, right? But when it comes to the young people, these are our hope. So we need to get behind young people. I want to tell you about the first time I came to America, ladies and gentlemen. So the first time I came to America, I went to Disney World, of course, <laughs> right? And I remember we were getting into that line to get onto the roller coaster, right? And as we get to the front, the gentleman who's helping people, oh, take off your hats, take off your glasses. Hey, how are you? Where are you from? I'm from South Africa. Oh, South Africa. Wow, beautiful country. Tell me, how big do the lions get, he asked me. I'm like, what? I look at my cousin. I say, uh, do you know what he's talking about? I said, sorry, sir, I don't work at the zoo. Um, I don't work on a safari. I have no idea how big the lions get. And then we travel along, we go to London, we meet another gentleman. And um, the gentleman says, oh, South Africa, oh, wow, beautiful country. I want to travel to South Africa, but I heard it's so dangerous. It's so dangerous in Africa. I need, I need security to go to South Africa. I said, no, 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 sir. You see, my, my grandfather is the president. I don't have a single guard. I think you'll be just OK. I think you'll be fine. And so I realized that people from outside the continent of Africa have very limited knowledge on Africa. And the little knowledge that is perpetuated by mainstream media, that Africa is a place of war, poverty, disease, and dictators. And the only positive thing for Africa is going on a safari. Going to see the animals? What about the people? What about the people, ladies and gentlemen? You know, if I had to show you a video of me walking through a mall in South Africa, you'd tell me that, nah, 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 that's not Africa. You say that's somewhere in Europe, 
right? But let me tell you, we know that, okay, Africans can sing and dance. Whoopie woo hoo, whoopity dee da, right? Fine. Let's forget about that. Have you heard about Mauritius? Have you heard about Madagascar? Have you heard about Reunion Island? You think Hawaii is beautiful? Come to Mauritius, I'll show you something. You will see the most beautiful islands in the world. That's on the west coast. On the east coast, you have places like Seychelles. You have Cape Verde, right? I bet you didn't even know that we have penguins in South Africa. Did you know we have penguins in South Africa? Let me see a raise of hands who knew that we have penguins in South Africa. Let me see, let me see. Okay, okay. Still not enough. Still not enough. We have ostriches in South Africa. Have you ever tasted an ostrich burger? Delicious. Delicious. Right? So Africa is one of the most amazing places and people always ask me, Daba, why do you have so much hope in Africa? Why do you, why do you, I mean, look at the things that have the dictators. I say, listen, let me tell you why I have hope in Africa. Do you know why I have hope in Africa? Because I'll tell you about a young man by the name of Kelvin Doe from Sierra Leone, from a little town called Freetown. This young boy grew up at the age of 11 playing on the dumps, right? Playing on the dumps, playing on the dumps, playing with all things that he can find. Next thing you know, this kid figures out how a TV and a radio works at the age of 12 years old, right? Next thing you know, this kid is now fixing radios and TVs of the people in his township, right? Next thing you know, at the age of 13, he creates his own radio station, calls himself DJ Focus, right? By the age of 14, that main radio station is interfering with the national radio station of the country. By the age of 16, he's going to MIT and teaching other kids older than him about these transistors and things that I don't even know how do it work, right? That's a kid with no formal education whatsoever, taught himself on the dumps of Sierra Leone. I'll tell you about another kid by the name of Siak Uza, who happens to come from my village, Mtata. It's a small town in the Eastern Cape. Siak Uza is playing in his mother's kitchen you know you've got the chemicals, the cleaning chemicals. Next thing, Seth Uza makes jet fuel. Jet fuel, ladies and gentlemen. He bombs his mother's kitchen. <laughs> bombs it up. Now his mother's worried. Next thing you know, University of Cape Town is knocking on the door saying, oh, we need this kid to come here. He goes to UCT. When he's at UCT, he gets discovered by Harvard. Next thing you know, he's at Harvard. The amazing work that he does at Harvard, next thing you know, there's a plan in the galaxy next to us being named after Sia Koza, right? This is Africa, ladies and gentlemen. The ones that they thought had no hope, had no education, had nothing, will amaze you beyond. It is the young people that we believe in. It's the young people that we need to get behind because they're not stuck in the old ways that we are stuck in, right? And I want to talk about Martin Luther King. It was Martin Luther King Day last week, if I'm not mistaken. Correct? Yep. Sorry, I forgot something. There is a quote by a great lady, Coretta Scott King. Coretta Scott King says, it doesn't matter how strong your opinions are. If you don't use your power for positive change, you are indeed part of the problem. If you see somebody being prejudiced, somebody being racist, you have the responsibility, you have the obligation to punch the ugly head of racism and prejudice wherever it raises itself. If you don't stomp it out, you are part of that problem. Whether it's an institution, whether it's in your home, whether it's on the sports field, whether it's at your workplace, if you see somebody portraying those old age prejudices and racism, you have to say, hey, listen, I don't know if you noticed, but that's racist. That's a racist comment. We can't allow that. If you allow that, you are part of it. You are part of the problem, ladies and gentlemen, right? She says, the struggle is a never-ending process. Freedom is never really won. 
You earn it and win it in every generation. What's, why do we have to vote? The kids ask us. Look at the, look at the politicians, they're corrupt. Right? They're corrupt. The reason why you have to vote is because so you can remove those corrupt politicians and you can do the right thing. Joe ba President Joe Biden is a good man, but he's 82 years old. He doesn't relate to the interest of young people. He doesn't care about the interests of young people. He's got his own things to worry about. He has to worry about his medical condition. He has to make sure he's there for another four or five years. He has to be corpus mendus, ladies and gentlemen. You see? So I tell young people, if you don't vote, you don't have the right to complain. So many people have died and struggled for us to have the vote. Just six decades ago, women only got the right to vote. So we cannot throw that away. Look at Florida, what happened in Florida now. The governor has banned the teachings of African American studies. How dare you stop young people from learning about their own history? If that's not racism, ladies and gentlemen, then I don't know what is. And we cannot allow that. And it's happening because we refuse to vote. It's important that we vote, ladies and gentlemen. That is exactly what Nelson Mandela fought for. That is exactly what Martin Luther King fought for, right? Martin Luther King says, Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only the light can. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can. And in the same breath, Nelson Mandela says, if a person can be taught to hate, then a person can be taught to love, because love comes much more natural to the human condition than its opposite. And therefore, make your decisions not out of fear, but make your decisions out of hope. You know, we asked our grandfather, all those years you spent in jail, what is the one thing that you missed? And he said, all those years I spent in jail, I never heard the sound of children. You must understand that children represent hope. They represent new beginnings. And so the apartheid system was very what can I say, deliberate in making sure that they had a hard time and that never had hope of them coming out, right? But Madiba took it upon himself to say, I know that one day we will come out of here. He never gave up hope. He never gave up hope whatsoever. Martin Luther King, ladies and gentlemen, says life's most pertinent question what are you doing for others? My grandfather says, to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that protects and promotes the freedom of others. Right? That protects and promotes the freedom of others. I cherish my own freedom very dearly, but I cherish the freedom of others even more. Those are the words of Nelson Mandela. We are a diverse people, and diversity, through diversity, ladies and gentlemen, there is strength. I come from South Africa, here comes a man from Japan, here comes a man from Massachusetts, here comes a man from India. Now we are together, we are learning, we're in the dorm, we're in the corporate world, we're learning. I see my friend making tea, I'm like, oh, that's how you make tea in India. Okay, okay, interesting. I see different ways of how people are doing the same things. And maybe I find that more efficient or better than the way I do it. So I'm learning to do things in a better way. So actually, we should yearn to meet people from different backgrounds so we can learn something, right? And become better at doing things. And when we come together, ladies and gentlemen, through unity, there is power. I say to young kids, you can take a one matchstick, you can break it very easily, right? But if you take 100 matchsticks and try to break them, you can't. So there is power through unity. There is power in numbers. And another quote I would like to talk about is said by Martin Luther King. He says, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. 
our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. So we cannot be silent about things that matter. When young people want to pick up a cause, they can't choose a cause because they're trying to impress Mary in their class. They can't pick a cause because I think Brian would love that because Brian is interested in that cause. No, you have to do something that speaks to you. You know, the passion. I always ask young people, I said, what makes the best doctor? What makes the best lawyer? Hmm? It's the passion that they have for their job, right? It's the love that they have for the job. And you have passion and love for your job, you will never work a day in your life, right? Your career and your, and your profession becomes an extension of yourself. You see, when a plumber gets a call at two in the morning that Farmer Brown's house is underwater and the pipes are broken, he doesn't drag his feet. Oh my goodness, damn. I have to get out of bed. I have to. No, he doesn't do that. He gets excited. He says, oh, well, I can't wait to hit those pipes. <laughs> he said, I have a number. Is it a number one or is it a number two wrench? He gets excited, right? And that's how you have to be when you're in your career path. You cannot be, you know, under the weather. Even if you're under the weather, you still find that little bit of strength to see a client, maybe not in person, but you see him, you know, online. Because, of course, COVID has taught us that you don't have to go to the office every day to do your work, right? You can do it remotely, right? But ladies and gentlemen, it's really going to take all of us to come together, to work together in order for us not only to teach the young what is better, but to be able to change this world. Nobody is born hating another person because of the color of their skin. That is a learned thing. That is something that they learn. When kids at school are portraying these things of prejudice and racism, that's something that they learned at home. That's not them. Kids don't know the difference between black and white. They don't know those things. That is something that they learn. So we need to make sure that we are teaching our kids about the power of love, unity, and respect. And now, before I go, ladies and gentlemen, I want to teach you a little salute. Are you gonna, can, in, in South Africa, there's a special way in which we salute our leaders. And I want you to salute with me. Can we do that? Can we do that? Yes. Okay, that's more like it. That's more like it. So when I say, long live, the spirit of Nelson Mandela, long live, you respond and say, long live. Are you with me? Yes. Okay, let's try this out. Huh? Long live, the spirit of Nelson Mandela, long live. Long live. Long live, the spirit of Martin Luther King, long live. Long live. Long live, the spirit of Coretta Scott King, long live. Long live the spirit of Pond Fred School. Long live. Long live. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen. One more. One more. One more, ladies and gentlemen. One more. And I'm going to ask you to all stand up. Those who can stand up, please stand up with me. Please stand up with me. And I'm going to ask you to stretch your hands out like this. We're going to stretch out our hands like this. Get loose. Get loose. Yes. Now, I want you to repeat after me. I want you to, to, to say these words as this, these were your own words. I want you to say it with conviction. I want you to raise your voices. Okay? Are you ready? Yes. Our hands. I am a leader. I am a leader. I am a leader. What my mind can conceive, what my mind can conceive. I, can I can achieve. It is in our hands. To work, together, to work together, to make this world, make this world a, better place. a better place. I thank you. Ten out of ten. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, we have a few minutes uh, before. We do have a reception uh, and a book signing opportunity in the DuPont Library after this, but we do have a few minutes uh, to take some questions. So I have a mic runner here and a mic runner there, so I don't have to do the stairs anymore today. Um, so any questions? Quaidney Tomp, <laughs> welcome, my friend. Thank you. Um, you've climbed many mountains. I was just wondering, what is your next mountain to climb? Oof, it's a big one. It's a big one. Uh, the next mountain that we have to climb is to unite the people of Africa. We have to remove those borders, not physically, but why should I pay a visa to go see my brother in Nigeria? Why should I go pay a visa to go see my brother right next door in Zimbabwe, in Swaziland, you know? I mean, this is, you know that these borders were not created by Africans, right? We have 54 countries in Africa, 54 countries. All those lines that you see in Africa were drawn by Europeans in 1889 during the Berlin Conference, which was led by King Leopold of Belgium, right? So it is up to us to conscientize our brothers across the Atlantic, right here in America, to say, brothers, you have the responsibility because you are privileged, you have education, you have work experience, it is time that we unite, it's time that we come together. Each one needs to teach one. We need to develop this nation, we need to build infrastructure, we need to build institutions so that we don't have a situation where young people from the countries of Mali and Senegal and Morocco are risking their children's lives, taking a small little raft to cross the Mediterranean Ocean, looking for better opportunities in France and across Europe. That's what we have to do. Thank you for coming. I thoroughly enjoyed your book, and um, I think that it's something that should be part of the high school curriculum. You Thank are you. incredibly relatable, and I think teenagers especially would uh, find a lot of good from that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, my question is, at the point that you had decided to leave your grandfather's home and return back to your father's, was um, retrospectively, do you wish that he had said no, don't go back to your father's, or those experiences, do you know what I mean? Like, um, um, your life was much different living with your father than it was your grandfather. Yes, it was, but... Much more structured. Much more structured, but I think I needed to go and be with my father because it ended up being last for two, three years of his life. Yeah. Um, so it was somewhat of a blessing in disguise. And I also needed to learn to be able to be structured and to be disciplined on my own. You know, we can't be, what's the term, helicopter parents, right? So at some point, you have to allow the young people to, to go out on their own and, and figure the things out for themselves. Um, and also, I mean, my, me and my grandfather buried my father together at the end of the day. And obviously, I returned back home. So, and another thing, his house was literally two-minute drive. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't put that in the book, but like, his house... <laughs> his house was literally two minutes away. It was like maybe three kilometers away. If I walked, it would take me about 25 minutes. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a good plus. That was a good plus. I still went home now and again to go take some food at my grandfather's house, so when my father was away. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for coming. You. How do you feel about capitalism? I mean, capitalism is what we're working with these days. Capitalism is, is good. I mean, um, I can't fight against capitalism because capitalism clearly won the Cold War. Um, but capitalism needs to be reined in, you know? Because if you look at our system here in America, um, it has aspects of socialism as well. You know, 
guys have uh, social grants and you have social welfare, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no perfect system, you know? I think capitalism maybe is the, the least of all evils, as they say, you know? Democracy is the least of all evils. But can I tell you that even though my grandfather believed in democracy, but maybe democracy was good for South Africa because of our past. But in a country like Rwanda, right, you have President Paul Kagame, who's simply a dictator, right? I think he's been president for more than 20 years now, since the, since the genocide that took place, right? And he, even though he says these are free open elections, his critics are jailed, house arrested, et cetera, et cetera. But when you look at the state of the country, he, his country is developing at a faster rate than even our own country. They've got the best internet. Every Saturday, he has made the people get up off their houses, and on Saturday mornings, the whole country has to clean their street. Not their house, the street. Everybody has to clean the street where they live. That is the fastest developing nation today, and yet they are living under a dictatorship. You see, in Africa, before the white people came, we were kingdoms, right? And in the kingdom, nobody died of starvation, right? Everybody had their place. You had the nobles, you had the clergy, you had the commoners, everybody knew what their job was. If you were sick in Africa, they would tell you, walk into that tree, stay there for two hours, and then by the time you finish, you'll be healed. How did they know that information? How did they know that? We didn't have, um, you know, guys didn't have labs and you know, testing things, what chemicals are coming out of here. It was just knowledge that was passed down from generation to generation, right? So some of the things that capitalism has brought has actually killed the planet. See, we in Africa were developing at the same pace as Mother Nature. But because of the scarcity of food that Europeans were having, that is why they were forced to then build huge structures so they can control the environment, so they can control food. So the clash of civilizations really comes from a mentality of a scarcity mentality versus an abundant mentality. We were living in abundance here in Africa. Then the, then the Europeans came to Africa and they were living in scarcity. They had to go and search for other lands to find ways to get food and find ways. And they came to Africa and they saw that we had a sanitation system. And they said, wow, how is it possible that these guys had a sanitation system? Yet we don't have one. Europe had the plague. We never had the plague in Africa. Did you ever think about that? We never had the plague in Africa because we had a sedimentation system, right? In Europe, they would literally you go into the bathroom in the back of the house, in the bucket, and they throw it out the window, right? And there were pigs and cows living in the backyard, you know? There was a place, you know, they talk about Africa not having a written history, that everything was passed down verbally. No, that's not true. There's a kingdom called Timbuktu, which exists in modern-day Mali, right? There was universities in Mali. They had telescopes in Mali. They had libraries in Mali. Thousands of books in Mali. Thousands of written books in Mali in Africa. You understand what I'm saying? Guess what? The Europeans came. They were shocked. They were amazed. They never had libraries that time. When Jan van Riebeck came, when all these so-called explorers came who discovered South Africa, how do you discover a place when there's already people there with their own culture, with their own customs and practices, right? They burned those libraries. They tried to burn any evidence they could to discredit our people from, we are knowledgeable people, we are amazing people. You understand what I'm saying? Pythagoras is not from Europe. Pythagoras is from Egypt. They took it, they remixed it, and then they gave it back to the world. We were doing Pythagoras long before they entered Africa. You understand what I'm saying? So we need to be able to understand where we come from, because if you don't know where you're coming from, you will never know where you are going. And it's important for young people to understand their history. When, today I was in a class talking about legacy. What are you leaving behind? What is your goal? Who are you? Where do you come from? What do you stand for? If you don't stand for anything, ladies and gentlemen, you will fall for everything. Hi, thank you for coming. 
Um, let's just say you were going to run for president <laughs> in your country. <laughs> and we, we were the voters. What would you say to us to get our vote? Like, boom, you got our vote. What would you say? Like, not like make South Africa great again, or what would you, <laughs> so, we would, so we would follow you, just saying, say, okay, now all of us here are gonna vote for you. What's like you know, the priorities, healthcare, roads, education? So we would say, yes, we will follow you to the end of the world. You have our vote. Yeah, a catchphrase or what? So, uh, just so. I think what I stand for more than anything, I stand for progress. We need progress. A person who was a manager wants to be a director. A person who lived in a tin shack wants to live in a house. Everybody wants progress in their lives. We want better health care. We want better quality education for our people. We want progress. That's what we want. You know? We need healing as a people. So many atrocities have taken place here in America. There's a big race war and a race divide in America. You see, in South Africa, they had the truth and reconciliation process that was led by Nelson Mandela and Bishop Tutu. In order for us to be able to heal, we need to be able to acknowledge the facts. But to your question, sir, progress is what I stand for. Um. Do you know uh, Trevor Noah? Is that proper? Yes, I know him. Um, I just happened to see him. He's a stand-up comedian. Yes. But I also read one of his books. Yes. So that's, this is my background of South Africa. Is what he says, is this how it, it, it is? I know I've seen it in the, the fences and the wires and, like you say, the segregation. And what would... If we went there today, what could you tell me? The very first thing, when I saw it on, on YouTube, it was fenced. And that's all I saw. Is it like that everywhere, or is there certain neighborhoods, or is so, it just the city? South Africa is known as a semi-periphery economy, which means we have both developed and developing aspects to our country. Which means you have the harshest poverty and yet you have the highest luxury in the same country. Sometimes that ultra luxury and that damn poverty is separated by one street, right? So you have the Hollywood Hills. Let me tell you, I have houses in Cape Town that will put those houses to shame, right? with a much better view of the ocean, right? With penguins, you don't have penguins. <laughs> right? Ostrich burgers, right? Ostrich lasagna, huh? I'm talking about a butler. I mean, we have any, the highest luxury you can think of, we have it in South Africa. The poorest of poor, we have it in South Africa. We have all of that. But you see what it boils down to is leadership. It boils down to leadership. It boils down to leadership. Our leaders need to actually be there for the right reasons. We do not want leaders to be there so they can fill their pockets and fill their stomach. We have a, 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 a generation, what we call fat cats. Right? These are fat cats who are ruling us these days. They are not concerned for their citizens. But if we had the right amount of leaders, we can systematically get rid of that poverty. People want to talk about crime, but what are the root causes of crime? One of them is definitely poverty, and the other is a pure criminal element when you talk about organized crime. And where do the organized criminals recruit? They recruit from those who are poor, right? So if we could, my grandfather said, poverty is man-made. So if poverty is man-made, man can also get rid of that poverty if we work together, right? So it's about the will of the people. It's about the will of the leaders who is able to galvanize his people, bring people together, articulate the vision, and make that vision their own. 
That's what we need to do. It boils down to leadership at the end of the day. Yes, you will find those things, but you'll also find the opposite. So please come with your friends, your families, and come and enjoy our beautiful beaches. We have wine country that will put those California wines to shame. <laughs> and, and let me tell you something. Why is South Africa so special? Because I can live a first world lifestyle paying third world prices. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so my question is, and it's not a popular question, I'm going to say that to preface it. I love when people come and they hear a wonderful, wonderful talk. But we have to move from talk to action. That's right. And so what can you say to people? What are one or two things that you say, in addition to buying your book and learning the lessons? What would be something that you would say, these are two or three things that you can do today to stop racism in this country? Well, the first thing that I mentioned is that you need to punch its ugly head wherever it rears itself. It can be at your workplace, it can be at home, anywhere where you hear racial slurs, that person needs to be corrected. You need to let people know that you don't stand for that BS. That's what you need to do. That's the first thing you can do, right? The second thing you can do is to get behind these young people, support these young people, encourage these young people to stand up and be counted. We are privileged people. What is privilege, ladies and gentlemen? Privilege simply means you don't have to worry about where your next meal is coming from. You don't have to worry about where you're sleeping tonight. If those things are taken care of, you are privileged. And as privileged people, we have a responsibility and an obligation to do for others. Mutombo, former NBA player, used to say, when you have achieved success and you've reached the top, don't forget to send the elevator down to fetch your people to bring them up with you. Right? So let us support these young people. These are the people that are really going to bring us together. These are the people that are going to make sure that the social ills slowly deteriorate. These are the people that are really going to bring this world together. So we need to support these young people. We need to get behind these young people. They have the energy. They have the vigor. You know? That's what we need to do. We need to support minorities. We need to support women. Far too long have America been led by men. And what do men do? Warmongers, 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 warmongers. Warmongering everywhere we go. Making R fives, jet planes, you want to do bombings. No, it's time for women to come in. We need love, ladies and gentlemen. We need the softer touch, ladies and gentlemen. We need to support black women, brown women, for them to stand up and be counted and let them lead the way. That's what we need to do. Real quick, have your life ever been threatened for being a peace uh, ambassador? Does, do people out there want you not to spread the, the word of peace or? No, nobody, I've never been nobody threatened. Nobody has? No, no, no. Thank you. Shall I take one more and then we'll move to the reception? Um, oh, there's two, can I sorry. Have? Okay, so one up top, one down here. Two more, okay. How does this go? There you go. Where we start? Okay, let's we'll start. Uh, hi. Uh, hi, ma'am. <laughs> welcome. So nice to have you here. Thank you. Um, I'm in tourism and travel, mostly nice. travel. Nice. And that's a really high indicator of education of, of oneself is to travel. Right. Uh, what I would like to know or talk about, if you can, very briefly, I've not seen the documentary, but talk about South uh, Celebration Park and the current situation in South Africa. You say the Celebration Park? Celebration Park. The Which, division. Yeah, do you anything about that? I don't understand. Okay. No, never mind. So how are politics these days in South Africa? <laughs> oh, the politics in South Africa these days are dire. They are not in a good position. We have a president um, that we believe is... So the power issue is a, is a serious issue because people can't do business when there's no power, right? I mean, yeah. 
and it really hinders the growth of the, of the economy. And the economy is really suffering right now in South Africa because of this power issue. And so in South Africa, we generally were using coal, right? Now, America comes and forces us to use green energy, right? So with coal, to produce one megawatt of power, it was about five cents using coal. With this new green energy, it's about five rand. It's literally 50 times more to produce the same kilowatt that you do with coal. And what he's doing with the coal, he's selling the coal to Europe. He's selling the coal to Europe. There are trucks lined up for 10 kilometers at the, at the, at the bay, at the harbor, sending that coal overseas because he's getting a cut, right? So the leadership is always at the forefront of any developing nation, of any nation that's doing well. You have to look at the leadership. It's about young leadership. And exactly, exactly. Thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. Um, when you were speaking about um, empowering the youth and women, um, my mind, uh, in my mind, I, I acknowledge that your grandfather's position in history is well cemented. He is a pyramid. Um, but over his many years in prison, the late Winnie Nomzamo had to be the tip of the spear. Could you help us reflect on how her legacy has survived in South Africa among uh, her people? And, um, you know, I know she was a member of your extended family, but we, as we, as we focus on your grandfather, Sometimes she fades in, in behind him, but could you talk about um, how her legacy has inspired South Africa today? Yes. So Winnie Mandela, my grandmother, is the strongest woman I've ever known in my life. The strongest woman I've ever known. If I could find a wife that's a, a, a half as strong as her, I would, I would, be, I would have chosen a winner. You see, this woman kept the name Mandela, Nelson Mandela's name alive while he was in prison all those years. Um, she was tortured, she was raped, she was by the, by the security status of, of the, by the security apparatus of the country, of the apartheid regime. But her resolve also remained strong and steady. Um, you know, her enemy, uh, I think it was Malan, he said that he himself acknowledged the strength of Winnie Mandela. You know, he said, if you take Winnie up on a helicopter, and as you get up there in the clouds and you throw her out the helicopter, Winnie Mandela will bounce, dust her shoulders off, and keep on walking. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's an enemy who said that about her. Today, Winnie Mandela is really, she's, she's, we are all proud of her. That is the mother of the nation. Um, and all young ladies, all young women have high respect for her, you know? She is really the definition of strength. She is a pillar, like a mother, you know? A father, yes, the fathers are protectors and providers, but who are the ones that raise the generations? Who are the ones that teach generations, feed generations, right? It's the mothers. The mother is the most central role in any children's life, in any human man's life, right? Half of the population are men, half the population are women, but actually men all come from a woman. So in actual fact, I, would be, I wouldn't exist without a woman. That's why we need to support our women. That's why we need to let our women lead. Because men have clearly been doing a terrible job. <laughs> <laughs>